Sup, you beautiful bastards? Hope you have a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're going to talk about today, the most requested story of the day today, a YouTuber who will not get out of the news, Jake Paul. Jake, of course, one of the largest YouTubers on the platform. He made news last week because of all the chaos around his home. He had neighbors saying Jake Paul and the other occupants of that home have been making that neighborhood a war zone. Others calling it a living hell, and all over mainstream news, we saw Jake Paul doing things like burning furniture in his backyard, he had flames going over the house, there was videos of destruction of property, Jake on a motorbike, him jumping on top of a news van, being fun of the reporter, and in general just kind of being a douchebag. There was also news that the community was going to have a meeting to see if they were going to file a class action against Jake Paul. But also a lot of people started asking the question, how the hell is Jake Paul still with Disney Channel? Usually Disney stars, while they're with the brand, have to be pretty squeaky clean. Many pointing to when Disney separated itself from PewDiePie. Well, over the weekend, it seems that the other shoe finally dropped. Jake Paul and Disney both making statements, which were kind of the same thing, but not. Disney's statement reading, We've mutually agreed that Jake Paul will leave his role on the Disney Channel series Bizardvar. On behalf of the production company, the cast, and crew, we thank Jake for his good work on the TV series for the past 18 months and extend our best wishes to him. And Jake Paul's statement was kind of the same thing, but you'll notice the differences. Jake writing, Long story short, my team Disney Channel and I have come to the agreement it's finally time for me to move on from the Disney family and Bizardvar. Being a part of the Disney family for the past two years was incredible and a dream come true. I love my castmates and will continue to support Disney, but I have outgrown the channel and feel it's time to move forward in my career. At this point in time, I'm wanting to focus more on my personal brand, my YouTube channel, business ventures, growing Team 10, and working on more adult acting roles. Now the main difference there is the note that I have outgrown the channel. Many saw that as a bold, unnecessary, disrespectful thing to say. And while it is, it is also kind of true. If you look back to the first season of Bizarre Vark, it got 1.27 million viewers on average. And at that same time on Jake Paul's YouTube channel, if he uploaded something, he got maybe between 250,000 to 500,000 views. He jumped to season two of Bizarre Vark, they're now averaging 1.22 million, and Jake Paul, pretty much every video he puts out gets over six plus million views. So well, kind of a cocky and douchey thing to say, he is accurate there. If you're not a fan of Jake Paul, it still doesn't take away from the joy you probably feel with uh, well, how their song aged. Yeah, my brother messed up, but he still got his Disney contract. You are fake news. But the reality of the situation is he does not need Disney. Now, as far as both parties here saying there's a mutual agreement, I highly doubt that. Everything Jake Paul has thrown out there into the world where he's talking about his Disney Disney Channel flow, They're talking about his Disney contract, you can tell that job, that affiliation was a badge of honor for him. From the outside looking in, it looks like Disney was probably like, we have to separate from you. Jake Paul or his team says, okay, we understand, let's not talk shit about each other. But unfortunately, that wasn't the only reason Jake Paul has been in the news the past few days. Jake Paul, whether on purpose or accidentally, seems to have doxxed Post Malone in his vlog. Post Malone, if you don't know, fantastic rapper, singer, producer. So the question, of course, is why, how, what? Well, Post Malone is a friend of YouTube Ethan Klein. He's an every now and then guest and contributor to his content. Post Malone, as you might understand if you have working ears, criticized Every Day Bro, a song by Jake Paul. He did this on the H3H3 podcast, but then, seemingly like a joke, posted on Twitter buying a bunch of Jake Paul merch. Now, in the normal world, that would be where the story ends. Unfortunately, we no longer live in the real world. We are in the Every Day Bro zone. And Jake Paul, whether from internet sleuthing or by getting Post Malone's address from Fanjoy, a separate company that sells Jake Paul's merchandise, gets Post Malone's address and decides I'm going to hand deliver this stuff and I'm going to film it. And that's exactly what he does. He films the entirety of Post Malone's home. You can see the license plates on his cars, everything. Then they shoot the interaction from across the street. He then asks Post Malone if it's okay if they vlog. Meanwhile, not addressing the fact that he's been secretly recording from across the street the entire time. And you can just tell Post Malone is just trying to deal with this as, as nicely as possible when someone you don't know randomly shows up to your home. One of my favorite parts is when Jake Paul is trying to convince Post Post Malone to be on an official Jake Paul track. And Jake Paul's like, I'll send you the song. I don't know how I'll get it to you though. Hint, hint, wink, wink. I'll send it to you. I don't know how. I'll tweet it to you. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Thank you. Now, for those of you that don't understand that interaction, that was a no with a smile. Okay, yeah, we'll figure it out. I could be giving you some of my personal information right now and we would exchange that and be able to continue this conversation in the real world. But this is my way of saying, no, you fucking crazy person who just showed up at my home. Also, a quick note to anyone that ever deals with Jake Paul, it seems that secretly recording is just part of what he does. He also came under fire this week from going to apologize to his, well, apologize to his neighbors while secretly recording those interactions from across the street while mic'd up. Which, by the way, is illegal in California. Post Malone footage, a lawyer might be able to say, well, he agreed to be in a vlog. There, it seems like Post Malone is only talking about the vlog camera, not aware that he's 
being recorded from across the street. But the recording of his neighbor seems to go against the invasion of privacy. California is known as a two-party state. That means recordings are not allowed unless all parties know this is being recorded and consent to it. I and mean, we're talking about a violation here that just one count of it, one count carries up to a $2,500 fine and up to one year imprisonment. And according to Christopher Wolf, the reporter that started this whole big story, the neighbor filed an eavesdropping complaint against Jake Paul. And that's without even going into Jake Paul alleging that a neighbor messed with one of their cars and then that car almost crashed and the neighbors tried to kill them. This guy has already taken up too much time from today's show. But there are a few notes I want to end on here. The first being is if Jake Paul got Post Malone's address from Fanjoy, I will never ever purchase anything from your site even though I want that David Dobrik clickbait shirt. That would be disgusting and looks like a huge invasion of privacy. And the last thing I want to note on is Jake Paul as a person. I've seen a lot of the comments saying, Phil, why are you taking it so easy on Jake Paul? And the reason for that is while I won't hold back talking about a story, I don't go out of my way to try and ruin people's careers or trash them. There's part of me that has wanted to go soft on him because I've been a young, successful, not to this level YouTuber. I've let it get to my head once again, not to this level. I want to say he's just a young guy making a shit ton of money. No one's checking his ego. But the more I actually look at everything that is Jake Paul, the more I realize He's just a fucking douchebag. And he carries the blame for his actions, but also there is blame to be spread around. This is a fantastic showcase, and it is not rare. This is a common occurrence. A fantastic showcase of no one in your life holding you accountable because everyone has something to gain from you. People trying to come in and make a career for themselves by leeching off, friends, family, everyone. And I've seen Logan Paul, Jake Paul's brother, defending him in a video saying, my brother represents everything about my brand, merch plug. He's a maverick, and I have to say, Logan, if this was anyone but your brother or a friend, you would realize this person is a fucking douchebag. And I say that while acknowledging that all of that same douchebaggery has led to both of you becoming multimillionaires. But money doesn't change facts, and I think that's a note I want to end on here. But of course, this is the Philip DeFranco show. I want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? Do you agree? Do you disagree? What are your thoughts on someone getting a pass because of their age? I'd love to know your thoughts. But from that, I want to share some stuff I love today and today in awesome. The first bit of awesome, come on, we got trailers for days. Thank you, Comic Con. But Boom, right off the back, Justice League trailer. It's like four minutes of the damn movie. Then we got Thor Ragnarok, which seems to have a whole different vibe than the previous Thor movies, and I'm digging it. Side note, Marvel and DC fans, it is okay if you liked both of these trailers. They both genuinely look good. Then we got a trailer for season two of Stranger Things. Yes, please, I need some more Netflix goodness in my life, which by the way, Ozark is out, and it's actually pretty good so far. Then we got a teaser trailer for Ready Player One. Love the book, I'm excited, but of course skeptical for the movie. We got a trailer for season two of Westworld, and holy shit. Did it looks dark? Then a trailer for the Doctor Who Christmas special, Marvel Defenders. Then non-trailer goodness, we got Rick and Morty behind the scenes stuff. And well, one thing that I want to say for the secret link. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then I want to talk about that Florida drowning story that happened last week. There's new information coming out. If you haven't heard, there was a man that walked into and drowned in a pond. And while that was happening, five Florida teenagers filmed it happening and they were laughing and making jokes about it. And as you'd imagine, Imagine when people found out about this, they were furious. This is disgusting. Now, I'm not going to be showing any of the video here. The state attorney's office has asked the media not to publish the video, but the sister of John Muldoon has asked for people to share the video. So the compromise in my head is to not show it here, but link it. And the video is disgusting. You have the guy that walked into the lake, 31-year-old Jamel Dunn. He's drowning. He's screaming. The teens are laughing, and they say he just died. They say we didn't even try to help him. They make fun of the guy that says they could have helped him. And many have called for the teenagers to be punished here. But it really didn't seem like the police could do anything. The Police said they saw no justification in the boys' actions. Authorities said they were troubled after interviewing the boys and some of them had no remorse. But Florida is not one of those states where you could be charged if you see someone in trouble and you don't help. The state attorney explaining in a statement, we were asked to make a preliminary review of the video regarding any potential charges for failure to provide aid. Unfortunately, there is currently no statute in Florida that compels an individual to render a request or seek aid for a person in distress. We are, however, continuing to research whether any other statute may apply to the facts of the case. And eventually they did find something, but it's most likely not going to make anyone that wants the boys to be punished happy. The boys seem to be in violation of the Duty to Report Act. It states, It is the duty of any person in the district where a death occurs who becomes aware of the death of any person occurring under the circumstances described in 406.11 to report such death and circumstances forthwith to the district medical examiner. Any person who knowingly fails or refuses to report such death and circumstances shall be guilty of a misdemeanor of the first degree. The thing is, even if they are convicted of this first degree misdemeanor, that is just a fine of $1,000. Also, it appears the authorities are really stretched here. If this is successful, they say it's the first time that this will actually have been enforced in a case like this. And this case also might lead to a change in the law. Mayor Henry Parrish III saying, in a case like this, we struggle to understand how anyone could be so cold and heartless and then learn that there are no laws in Florida that obligate someone to render aid or call for someone
one to render aid for a person they see in distress. And I'm fascinated by the debate around this story. Thanks to a home security camera, we know Jamel Dunn, of his own will, went into the pond. His actions, which may have been connected to what police say was a verbal altercation earlier in the day. And then you have these five teenagers, very far away, one of them's filming, making jokes of being pretty damn heartless. It doesn't appear that there's any way they could have gotten to Dunn themselves. Even if they called someone, it doesn't look like anyone would be able to rescue him in time, but there we're dealing with hypotheticals. But also, disgustingly enough, they didn't even call to say they had just witnessed a death. But part of that may have also been due to the teens admitting now that they smoked weed. And so I wanted to throw that debate out there because I feel like on this show we have a lot of talks about personal responsibility. And that also brings up the question of what do you think about good Samaritan laws? That if you see someone that needs rescuing that you have to rescue them. You have to try and help. If you see someone in a wheelchair on railroad tracks and they're stuck and they can't get out, you've got a minute and a half to two minutes till the next train gets there, are you responsible if you don't do anything? Should you be punished? I'd love to know your thoughts here. And then we had a very sad update to the Charlie Guard story. Charlie was a little boy we talked about a few weeks ago that was born with mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome. He couldn't see, hear, cry, swallow. The parents were fighting with the hospital and the government to allow them to try experimental treatment in the United States. The hospital not even allowing the parents to take Charlie home. The hospital arguing that the only humane thing to do was to allow Charlie to die at the hospital. It's been a while since we talked about this. Last week, the doctor from the United States that was going to work on Charlie. He's a neurologist at Columbia Medical Center. He pioneered this new therapy. And upon examining Charlie, conducting these tests, it was decided that the muscle atrophy as well as the brain damage was irreversible. And the parents have now ended their appeal. As Charlie's devoted and loving parents, we have decided that it's no longer in Charlie's best interests to pursue treatment and we will let our son go and be with the angels. We now know, had Charlie been given the treatment sooner, he would have had the potential to be a normal, healthy little boy. We will have to live with the what-ifs which will haunt us for the rest of our lives. Despite the way that our beautiful son has spoken, has been spoken about sometimes, as if he is not worthy of a chance at life, our son is an absolute warrior and we could not be proud of him and we will miss him terribly. To Charlie, we say, Mummy and Daddy, we love you so much. We always have and we always will and we are so sorry that we couldn't save you. Sweet dreams baby, sleep, sleep tight our beautiful little boy, we love you. So the father announces this decision, says goodbye to this little boy, but then does bring up the argument that if he had been allowed to go, from the beginning, Charlie Gard had a chance. But after all of this fighting with the hospital and the government, that's why it's too late. Or to paraphrase, the hospital was right in their decision, but they're only right because they denied us from the beginning. The hospital, the government, politics in general kept them from having a chance. And as a parent, I can't help but wonder about what he even said there, the what ifs. In September 2016, Charlie, who's one month old, is diagnosed with this rare condition. In January, the mother finds this doctor that says that he could do something here. They get the financing and then they they're stonewalled by the hospital. And hearing now that the doctors saw earlier scans and said that there was a chance for this little boy, it just, it breaks your heart. And then let's talk Russia America news. The US House and Senate have managed to do something they have not really been able to do at all this year. Agree on something. We're talking almost unanimously. They reached an agreement on new and stronger sanctions against Russia. And so this move from the US Congress is going to put the president in a very weird place. President Trump said it was an honor to meet Putin, says he sees very positive things in store for Russia and the United States together, saying he and Putin had very good talks. Now the sanctions aren't going to just hit Russia, they also are going to hit Iran and North Korea. Now the original version of this bill, which did not include North Korea, passed 98 to 2. Well, because the bill dealt with revenue, it had to be approved by the House first. So when the bill went to the House, it was amended to then include North Korea in a 419 to 1 vote. And at that point, it looked like everyone was on board. Speaker of the House Paul Ryan said that the bill would hold all three of these bad actors accountable. House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy saying that the House will vote on the bill tomorrow. But then there was some fear that the President was going to veto this bill, which doesn't even make sense. We'll get to why in a second, but there was some fear because Donald Trump tweeted, as the phony Russian witch hunt continues, two groups are laughing at this excuse for a lost election taking hold. Democrats and Russians. It's very sad that Republicans, even some that were carried over the line on my back, do very little to protect their president. Although I personally believe those tweets were about the alleged collusion between the Trump administration and Russia. And as far as why it doesn't make sense why there would be any fear of a veto, the House and the Senate have supermajority approval for this bill. So even if the president vetoes it, as long as Congress has two thirds of the vote, they can override the president's veto. Also, President Trump couldn't do the pocket veto. Pocket veto is when the president doesn't sign a Congress approved bill. And then 10 days later, when it would have been brought back to Congress, Congress is on holiday so no one can receive it. Although Congress rarely allows that to happen anymore. They usually leave representatives. And so even if Donald Trump did not sign this after 10 days, it would be approved. But finally, one of the biggest updates to this story is the White House has come out in support of these sanctions. Sarah Huckabee Sanders saying, the administration is supportive
supportive of being tough on Russia, particularly in putting these sanctions in place. The original piece of legislation was poorly written, but we were able to work with the House and Senate and the administration is happy with the ability to do that and make those changes that were necessary and we support where the legislation is now. But even with that statement, it feels like we have a tale of two White Houses. We have a president that speaks very highly of Vladimir Putin, says we're having great talks, great things ahead, despite an intelligence community that has Obama and Trump appointees in it saying that Russia did meddle in our election, still not being completely sold on it. This even coming from Anthony Scaramucci, the new White House communications director. Oh, which by the way, goodbye Sean Spicer. If only someone saw that coming a mile away. The main point, we have that president and those words coming from the administration. But then you have an administration saying, yeah, we're all for hard sanctions on Russia. It's just the language that bothered us. But we also have reports that administration officials unsuccessfully lobbied for changes to the provision that gives Congress veto power to block the administration from easing sanctions on Russia. The lawmakers rejected weakening that provision. To me at least, it doesn't seem like the president is happy, but he also doesn't want to be seen losing to Congress, especially on this specific topic. But that is my personal takeaway. I would love to know what you think here. And on that note, that's where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I try and do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you missed and want to catch up on the last Philip DeFranco show, you can click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you want to see the brand new behind the scenes vlog, click or tap right there to watch that. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.